Hello, my name's John Darlington and I'm the Executive Director of World Monuments Fund Britain and I'm absolutely delighted to be your host today on this Heritage from Home series run by World Monuments Fund. Now, our, our topic today is to focus upon the role of the contents of historic houses, specifically of art, of decoration, and in particular of statues, which give places their authenticity, which help people to understand them and interpret them, and of course will transport us in the 21st century to a much earlier time. But what happens if such essential contents are lost? What happens for which, for, for whatever reason, the statues have effectively left the building? This then is a story about how art and statuary can be reunited with their host. And in it, we will look and explore and discuss a decades long old school reunion at the magnificent Stowe House in Buckinghamshire. To help me, I have two guests who have been deeply involved in the work at Stowe House, and I shall introduce them after a, a short video. Uh, when uh, I introduce them, they will talk for, uh, for uh, some, some time about their experiences at Stowe and what they've contributed towards that, that fabulous place. And then after that, there's going to be an opportunity for you to, to ask questions. And so I'd encourage you to use the chat function below, ask your questions, uh, particularly think of those as they're speaking, and when they get to the end of their presentations, that will give me the opportunity to pose those questions to them. Before we do any of that, I thought I'd get us into an appropriately 18th century mood. And I'm going to take you on a, on a very brief road trip of three of Britain's finest mansions, which have all been supported by World Monuments Fund in the past or have the potentially to be supported in the future. And for all of these houses, the, the, the story that we're telling tonight and exploring tonight, the role of the contents of a house is absolutely crucial to how people experience and enjoy those places. So if you will, join me on my 18th century road trip recorded uh, later last year. And I hasten to add, I travel not in a car. And now before, it's time to set on off on your virtual one. journey. Here in the United Kingdom. Hello, my name's John Darlington and I'm Executive Director of World Monuments Fund Britain. We're going to go for an 18th century road trip which will take us from London through to Twickenham where we're going to visit Strawberry Hill. From there we'll head north to the county of Buckinghamshire where we'll stroll down the corridors of Stowe House. And finally, we'll end up at Castle Howard, perhaps one of the most romantic of the Baroque buildings that the UK has. Welcome to Strawberry Hill House. As the first Gothic revival structure in Europe, Strawberry Hill seamlessly blends landscape design, architecture, and decorative arts to forge a new direction in 18th century design and culture. The grounds and buildings with their uniquely designed interiors were the visionary project of writer Horace Walpole, the youngest son of Britain's first Prime Minister. Strawberry Hill was designed specifically to display his collections of fine and decorative art amidst rooms reflecting Gothic aesthetics and his fascination with materials. And one of the most astonishing touches is the inventive and often deceptive use of papier-mâché to render flourishes that could be mistaken for stone or wood architectural detail. World Monuments Fund in 2019 supported Strawberry Hill Trust to recreate two famous pictures by Joshua and Reynolds which once graced the walls of the house so that thousands of visitors who come through its doors can get a real sense and feeling what Walpole wanted people to feel when they went and entered his house. Welcome to Stowe. 
This is a house which has had the touch of every great British architect of the 18th century. World Monuments Fund has been involved at Stowe for over 10 years. Our support has helped to restore nearly all the public rooms on the main floor at Stowe, including the magnificent marble saloon, which is based upon the Pantheon in Rome and has to be one of the most beautiful rooms in the whole of the United Kingdom. Aside from that, a suite of other halls have the stamp of excellence in conservation. Last year, we helped to restore the final piece in the jigsaw. And that was William Kent's North Hall. The work included the recasting of a life-size copy of Laocoon and his sons that was based upon the famous copy in the Vatican Museums. And a very neat statue of Mercury, literally put in place a week or so ago. Stowe is equally famous for its landscape, designed by Charles Bridgman, and a very young Lancelot Capability Brown in his first real commission. If you wanted a place where you could really study and see the inspiration of those architects, Stowe is that place. Welcome to Castle Howard. The final stop on our 18th century tour is Sir John Vanbrugh's Baroque masterpiece. And the house is just stunning. You can really feel it in your heart when you, when you see this place. It's jaw-droppingly gorgeous in its Baroque splendour. And the whole of Castle Howard's interiors is decorated with this fabulous art. World Monuments Fund is entering a new partnership with the Howard family. What we're interested in helping them with is how to restore some of the Baroque landscape features that are scattered in the parkland around Castle Howard. In a wider sense, how do we bring this extraordinary landscape to life and make it accessible to a large number of people so that it may be forever conserved as a public good. Bye. Well, I'd like to pretend I actually cycled all the way from London uh, via Strawberry Hill and Stowe House up to uh, North Yorkshire, but I confess that would be a lie. Uh, however, I've much, very much enjoyed that uh, particular series of visits, as I say, not in a carriage and four, but an, on a Brompton and one. Uh, now let's turn to a little bit of detail. So we, we've seen a kind of general sweep of magnificent houses. Now we're going to focus upon Stowe House and the, the story about how uh, Stowe House has, has almost repatriated the contents of that building. Uh, and I have two guests to, to help us explore this particularly interesting topic. Uh, I have uh, Nick Morris, who is the Chief Executive of the Stowe House Preservation Trust. Nick, very good to see you. Thank you. Uh, and I have Rupert Harris of Rupert Harris Conservation. Uh, and Rupert is, uh, say, very much involved in the in the the, uh, the casting and the restoration of the statuary at Stowe House. So, hello, Rupert. Hi, John. Great. Okay. Well, we've got uh, we haven't got a lot of time, but we've got a lot to get through. So, I'm going to turn first to Nick. Nick, uh, we've had a bit of an introduction uh, to to Stowe, but I wonder if you could take us through the story of Stowe and the relevance of its contents and the restoration of those contents. To, to that place. Yeah, certainly, John. So um, good evening, everyone, and a very warm, if virtual, welcome to Stowe House, where the weather this evening is grey and sultry, but that doesn't dampen the spirit of this wonderful place. So if we move down away from the house, down the south front, 
you can see the full extent of this, the largest country house in Britain and the magnificently main, the magnificent building that Professor Michael McCarthy described as the largest and most completely realized privately owned neoclassical building in the world. If I just leave you with two general points this evening, it would be those, but also the words of Stowe School's founding headmaster, who hoped that anyone who had seen Stowe should know beauty wherever they saw it for the rest of their life. There's so much more to Stowe. So we have here a brief history, and it's a classic tale of the accumulation of, of great riches, continued spending when the funding ran dry, and the sad loss of the heir to the estate in the First World War. The house is the legacy of the Temple Grenville family, one of the most influential Whig families in 18th century Britain, who produced four prime ministers and are widely credited with introducing the taxes that caused the American War of Independence. And I should say for our American audience this evening, Harold Spender remarked that the Grenvilles lost us America, but I very be verily believe that they thought England sufficiently compensated by gaining Stowe. Uh, two great sales punctuate the history of the house, the second leading to its rescue by the formation of Stowe School. Um, and at that point, uh, this is where we, we lost a lot of the artefacts. So the first great sale, 1848, and then the second sale in, in 1921, effectively completed the job. But the house was saved by the formation of Stowe School. There are four key players in the, uh, in the history of the house and the surrounding landscape gardens. And I should say, although we're focusing on the garden, on the house tonight, the gardens are no less a part of this fabulous place managed by the National Trust. So looking at these key players from left to right, the founder of a dynasty and creator of the estate, Richard Temple, Viscount Temple, sorry, Richard Temple, uh, created Viscount Cobham in 1718. Richard Temple um, then passed the house to his uh, nephew, who another Richard Temple, who became the second Earl Temple, and then again to a nephew, because both of those first two died uh, childless, the, the nephew, uh, George Grenville, the Marquis of Buckingham. Now, we effectively owe the creation of the house to Cobham and uh, his nephew, Earl Temple, but it's his nephew, George Grenville, Marquis of Buckingham, who completed the job. Sadly, it is then Grenville, the Marquis's son and grandson, who spent beyond their means and led to the downfall of the estate. Today, the house and the estate are managed jointly by the Stowe House Preservation Trust, which was set up specifically to manage the restoration and open the house to the public. The Stowe School, who are effectively our tenants, and the National Trust, who manage the 400 acres of landscape gardens in which the house sits. And I think that in itself is a pretty unique partnership. The house serves a multitude of uses, as you can see here, from uh, school, so we get the next slide. The, uh, so uh, from a school, uh, the left hand, bottom left hand picture there on your screen shows uh, pupils engaging in a robotics competition. So there's not all classroom work, but it's a very active school and a very successful school. Um, and a commercial events, uh, wedding breakfast laid in the dining room, uh, wedding dancing in the marble saloon. And the house is open to the public daily, conditions permitting. Now, the restoration of a building like this would not have been possible for the school alone. And since the year 2000, we've spent about 26 million pounds on the programme, and it will take a further 14 million if we're to complete the job uh, altogether. None of this, I should say, would be possible without the generous support of the World Monuments Fund and many other benefactors and donors. But I'd also highlight that WMF has played a practical role in our work, a role I often characterise as support and challenge, which will, I hope, become apparent as we tour the state room, starting here in the North Hall and move on to the theme of statuary. Now, this is the entrance hall on the north side of the house at the stage when we'd restored William Kent's ceiling, as John outlined in his um, introductory video, but we hadn't touched the walls or the floor. And we had a dilemma because the staircase was set into the room in 1803 and therefore returning to Kent's 1735 scheme as 
uh, shown on the ceiling was impractical. But if you will, please notice how, despite the great work of art on the ceiling and some paintings on the walls, the room has a bare functional appearance and it's rather cold with a 1950s terrazzo floor that would have graced many a public building across the world, but really isn't appropriate or wasn't appropriate for an 18th century ducal palace. We're going to do a quick whiz round the, uh, the state rooms now. So below the North Hall is the winter entrance. This is the Egyptian Hall. Restoration has been complemented by the introduction of modern interpretations of the canvas wall paintings and a replica of the sarcophagus that cunningly concealed a heating stove in the 18th century. We go back upstairs into the, the marble saloon. Uh, restored in well, restoration completed in 2005 and I'll come back to the marble saloon as one example of, of the furnishing of a room but going through the doors you see ahead of you we uh, move straight into the state library so we move into the music room uh, now the music room just give me one second uh, features wall paintings inspired by scenes discovered in Pompeii only a few years before the creation of this room. Again, it's an indication of an appreciation of the classics. The chandelier that you see was generously funded by a donor through World Monuments Fund, and this donor had a particular aff affection for the building. The chandelier is an exact replica of the 18th century piece created from a photograph. The great library next to the music room uh, was also enhanced by the addition of the pendant lights in the centre. In this case we had two images, a single watercolour and a black and white pen and ink drawing from which to gauge the size, the shape, the design of those uh, pendant wall hangings, very generously funded by the same donor who purchased the chandelier for us for the music room, uh, but they effectively add to a room where the furnishings are, all, uh, are, ex uh, are existing, the wall bookcases are original, although obviously we have modern furniture for the use of the school, but the, li the light fittings are an essential part of recreating that atmosphere. And finally, on this side of the house, we move into the blue drawing room, which features silk damask covering the walls. And this was developed by one of our trustees and again supported by the World Monuments Fund. You can see we have relatively few paintings again. The painting in the centre facing you is a Viscount Cobham on loan from its owner. But we opted uh, in this case to reinstate the damask that had hung on the wall in the 18th century as part of the, uh, the restoration. If we return back across the marble saloon on the other side of the house, which is entirely symmetrical I should add, we come to the state drawing room. This is the most recently completed restoration project and John's video actually showed work underway on conserving the ceiling. Now, in this room, daily use dictated that damask would be inappropriate, and so we've used a simulated damask on the wall instead. And this is a, a perfectly good solution where you've got a very hard, we need a very hard wearing surface. To the left of the room, you can see a replica chimney piece. This has been made from a high resolution photographic scan of the original, which is now in the Santander Bank in Spain. So I hope that paints a little bit of a picture of the dilemma we have with uh, artefacts and furnishing in a house that's in daily use for something for which it was never intended. To us, it means there's nothing to detract from the architectural features of the room. But I suspect for other people, there would be a, a desire perhaps to see furniture and more detailed um, fittings in the room. It simply isn't possible for us to do that. And I suspect this is a subject we could discuss at some length uh, over several glasses of wine or your chosen uh, drink. But it, it's for us, we think we've made, I think we've made a virtue out of a necessity. We cannot refurnish this house because of its use. And so we've turned to every possible means we have to replicate its original appearance. And statuary is a very, very important way of doing that. Um, Saturate and light fittings, chimney pieces, all play their part because they will tell us much about the intent of the owners, patrons of, uh, of the buildings. Being realistic, 
we have to admit that their motivation may simply have been a desire to possess beautiful objects. But when we come to use them to tell the story, it reflects the classical learning of the patrons, where they got their inspiration from, where they went to on the grand tour, very important aspect of interpreting a, a great house. And in our case, political ideas, ideals and thinking. And then when we recreate the house, they enable some of the atmosphere of the property to be, uh, to be uh, reinstated. In terms of acquiring statuary or other artifacts, we have a number of sources to tell us what was to be found in the house and garden. If we could move on, thank you. Um, number of information sources. We have house inventories, we have catalogues and from the sales, which will tell us what was in the rooms and where they were disposed of. Uh, and we have occasionally contemporary images. So those are the kind of sources we use to look for suitable items to reinstate in the house. And then we have a number of options for how we do that. We can purchase the original if it's available and affordable, we can make a copy, we can negotiate a loan, or we can approximate it. And the first example I have for you is back in the music room where the Dance of the Hours painting uh, was the, we, we acquired the original and we managed to rest restore it and reinstate it in the house. On this slide, you can see that a slightly different story occurred for the Laucorn group, which John's referred to. Sometimes, frankly, you just get lucky. We weren't looking for this statue. It had stood in the North Hall between 1823 and uh, 1848, but a chance visit by one of our advisors to a house in the west of England uncovered its whereabouts. A check of our sale records confirmed this was indeed our statue, uh, and discussions started with the owner, who proved very willing to lend it to us so that a copy could be made provided we would fund essential conservation work to the original. Step forward, Rupert Harris, who visited, carried out a con condition survey and accepted the commission to make the copy. Rupert's going to describe the processes involved, but I'd like to make one point. He was fundamental to the process of establishing respect and trust with the owner. We and WMF had already worked with Rupert, but for the owner, entrusting an original statue to his care, that trust that confidence was even more important and so now we see the finished product hopefully uh, the picture to, to the right makes my point that the bare and functional hall has been transformed by the addition of the replica of the original statue that once occupied this important place uh, in the main entrance to the house and then to complement the Laocoan group we needed a mercury to replace the bronze copy after Jan Bologna that had stood opposite it and here we see the mercury, which Rupert again sourced for us, uh, found it off for sale in America. We accepted in this occasion that we couldn't find the original. We knew where it had gone. It had gone to a particular uh, household. They'd sold it on and it was no longer available to us to consider making a copy. So we looked to source one with the exact dimensions and luckily Rupert found it. And now the brief extract from the report on the 1848 Stowe sale indicates just how significant these two works of art were. Uh, and you notice that the, uh, re the report refers to securing the statue with great excitement by Mr Hume. Uh, it was indeed purchased for the Duke of Hamilton. And then we move on to Lalcorn, realising £120 and uh, also being, uh, uh, being sold with great excitement. So we're now back in the Marble Saloon. And the point I'd like to point make here is that we see a mix of replica statues acquired to replace unknown originals. We knew that the niches had held statues, but we had no exact records of what they were, and fiberglass replicas of the torchairs that stood in alternate niches. niches. So these are a very good approximation. Um, decided on by our experts and uh, made by Gyps Formerai in Berlin and reinstated in 2009. On the other hand, downstairs in the Egyptian hall, we can see two sphinxes, which are less accurate copies of the sphinxes that guarded the staircase up to the North Hall. These were purchased, believe it or not, from a builder's yard at a very low price. We don't pretend they're accurate and we regard them as very much a temporary measure but they meet a need and they give an idea of what was intended. 
they would score little for historical accuracy and my trustees remind me every time they come for a meeting of this um, but as long as we don't pretend otherwise then we uh, accept this and we will replace them as soon as something more appropriate comes to light and so moving on to our pièce de résistance the magnificent Medici lions on the south front these are themselves copies, they're exact copies in lead of the marble lions that stand in the Loggia dei Lenzi in the Piazza della Signoria in Florence. But in this case, we have the originals back at Stowe. They were sold in 1922 to a brewing magnate from the north of England, and they stood for 90 years in a public park in the seaside town of Blackpool on the northwest coast uh, up in Lancashire. Following a spate of metal theft in the area, uh, the town approached World Monuments Fund Britain to see if the lions might be safeguarded better by their return at Stowe. Uh, a loan was arranged and again in return for exact copies to be displayed in Blackpool, we gained the lions once more after their holiday beside the sea. Um, now you can see top left of this slide, uh, sorry can we go back one please, the top left slide shows uh, them in their position, in, or one of them in this position in Blackpool, outside a rather nice Art Deco cafeteria, then undergoing therapy in uh, Rupert's workshop, while in the bottom left we are removing a concrete lion by John Bickerdyke that had been in the site for, for, since 1923, and finally the replacement bottom right with the, the lead lion in its position, and interesting in the background you can also see copies of stone statuary, again exact copies made from the originals lo owned, loaned to us by their owners. So we had a, an interesting day when uh, Rupert delivered these statues back to Stowe and uh, at this point with an airborne lion weighing several tons we all had our hearts in our mouths but luckily it all ended well and for my conclusion I would just highlight how statuary has helped us to recreate some of the atmosphere of Stowe in its heyday. That's the last slide. Um, it's the ideal complement to restored spaces. It brings grace, interest and beauty to parts of the house and in this case looking out over the grounds. Above all, it's a tribute to the skill and knowledge of remarkable people and the teams they work with. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much for that, uh, that, that, uh, that tour of Stowe where you've condensed literally centuries of activity into into minutes uh, what I what I well I love many things about Stowe but what I particularly liked about your presentation was the fact that uh, it illustrated just the range of techniques which are available uh, to people who manage and look after uh, historic heritage so you can go from replication to the originals to approximation to to having nothing so that whole range of activity I think was beautifully illustrated there so thank you Nick you. now we're going to turn to the to the, the detail of uh, uh, what actually happened in Rupert's workshop that's what we really want to know so uh, we've already had hints and suggestions about the role that Rupert played in the the reconstruction and conservation of these statues so now let's turn to to you Rupert to hear hear the detail of, of how you made that work thank you thank you John um, I'm going to start just briefly hopefully to explain a little bit about the history of the sculptures because and the sculptor who made them because obviously as part from being practical conservation rest restorers of works of art understanding the, the, the sculpture and the history behind them is actually a crucial part, part of our work and I think if I start with the I'm going to talk you through three of the projects which Nick has already covered but we'll start with the lead lions. And these, these, this is a pair of a pair you can see in, in Swanley Park in, in Blackpool, Stanley Park in Blackpool. And they suffered a little bit because unlike most sculpture in bronze, for instance, you can cast them in sections and join them together. But in the 18th century, they had no way of casting lead in pieces and then joining it. So they were all cast in one piece which means they have their original, by the lost wax casting method, and they have their original core inside them, 
and in many cases iron armatures which gives them some strength and fixes them to their stone plinths and of course while because they're in a public park you can also see the problems with crushing and damage and people climbing on them i'm now going to show you a series of slides which might look rather dramatic um, but we have to deal with the conservation and get rid of the areas of problem and because the core is inside them I and in the center of the picture you can see the plaster core and inside that there is also iron and we have to remove this so we have to cut windows in the lead to remove all the core and excavate it out not only does it lighten the sculptures but it means we remove something that causes a corrosion and adds extra weight and then we move on to other part sections where we're now moving I mean, it's still on its original stone plinth, but we're starting to empty all the core out, we're removing the iron armature. I mean, I know it looks dramatic, um, but we very much concentrate on where we have to cut the windows to make sure we cut them in areas without heavy sculptural detail, so we can always work the surface back again. And the next slide will show you um, more of that and, and on the you can just about see I think in the in the hind quarters of the line there's a diagonal bar that's part of the old iron armature which we have to remove and we've now also taken it off its stone plinth and then the next stage after that um, is to start constructing a new stainless steel armature to go inside it and obviously as Nick explained we're talking about an object here that weighs over a ton and is actually quite soft and delicate so handling it safely in such a way that we can work on it well um, is problematic and it it means that we've got to work takes a while to get through and the next slide will show i think the the armature in, in more of a construction and you will see along the the back of the line we're building uh, the stainless steel in such a way to make absolutely sure, I know it's going back to Stowe School, but at the same time, we can't guarantee that people are not going to climb on them. So we wanted to make absolutely sure that there was enough support by the armature to make sure that the backs of the lines did not collapse should anyone choose to um, climb on them as a school prank. And then we, after that stage, we start to put all the patches back again. And we use traditional lead welding and so the patches go back exactly where they cut them out from and then we tack them in place like this to make sure they're all exactly in the right position and then we continue to put the sections together and the other part thing we need to do there was one missing tail of this sculpture and luckily we, we matched this from the the other line so we modeled a new tail and then cast this in lead and put it on so that that is the basic story behind restoring the original lions and i think the important thing about I, just before i move on to the issue of copying them um, these lines are made by john cheer who was probably the most famous sculptor working in lead and statuary in the 18th century um, very very productive he was one of a set of huguenots um, and Flemish Protestants who came over to England and set up businesses, the Van Nosts and Schumacher and Andrew Carpenter being others. And they were hugely successful and they ran very, very important businesses, selling sculpture all over the country and in Europe. And in fact, for those of you who have been involved in the WNF for a long time, will know about the Caluche project in the Palace of Caluche in Portugal, which has a large number of lead sculptures by John Cheer. And these are the same, same types of sculpture. And he was massively pr uh, prolific in making works. And he was probably the first, well, the, the Huguenot sculptors of London, and they all had their workshops near Piccadilly Circus. They were very commercial. They were businessmen, and they manufactured a huge quantity of works of art. From the classical sculptures we've seen, um, they went to Italy, took moulds off the originals and recast them. And 
Some of them are original and some of them they mass produced and there are many versions where you can go to country houses and see the same statue again. But unfortunately, because of the iron armature problem and the structural problem, and the fact that the sculpture fell out of favor, fashion, towards the end of the 18th century, um, a lot of the lead sculpture in, in, that used to furnish the gardens of England have, have sadly been lost. Um, but in the case of Stowe, of course, we managed to find these two originals. Um, so we'll move on now to the copying of them. And so obviously we had to restore the originals to their absolutely per perfect condition and shape before we could start to do the molding. So this is the first coat of a silicon rubber mold going on to one of the original lines and it's divided up into sections uh, which allows us to make sectional castings in lead and then the browns, brown areas you see are the dividers and the next image will show you the, the part of the casing going on so this is the rubber um, the flexible rubber into which we can make waxes to do the lost wax casting Unlike the 18th century, we can cast these in pieces. And the next slide will show you the fiberglass mold outside the rubber that holds all the rubber in, sh in place. So we get a very, very accurate reproduction. And then from that, we then start to do the casting process itself. And the next slide will show us uh, us starting to put this lead casting together um, and we have to work it I and mean, obviously we've got to get the positions exactly right so we always tack the whole thing together in loosely before we make a commitment to make sure that we, everything's in the right place and the next slide will show you the uh, section of the line and we chamfer the edges you can see the bottom left core edge of the line we ground the edge down to make a v-shape and that allows us to make sure when we lead weld it together we get a proper sound joint and then when we do the casting uh we then carry on the similar and you see here and we've also got a, you can just about see through the one window we've left the the armature we had to make in this as well and so we're now assembling and assembling and assembling and then when we've got it completed we then work the surface back and now this is almost complete with the stainless steel armature inside it and the last thing we have to do is then to patinate it and color it and then obviously we had in this case new stones made uh, to match the originals and these are the pair of replica lines back at uh, uh, in Blackpool um, and hopefully that's uh, they're very happy and and they're in hopefully in good condition still so the next we're going to move on now to the the, the the lines back at Stowe so here they are original but they also have the original patination we try very hard not to take the surface off the line other than where we have to work it to keep the patina on in place however it's very important to understand nearly all monumental figurative sculpture in lead in the 18th century was painted to look mainly like marble and in the case of these lines when these were first installed in stowe they were painted white to look like marble and you will find the same thing will apply to many of the country houses, whether it be Castle Howard, Studley Royal, uh, Stourhead, all those lead statues in those major English country gardens were painted to look like marble. And occasionally, some of them were painted to look like, painted to look like bronze. And when you're talking about figures like the uh, Comi de Delati figures and the rustic figures, they were heavily polychromed. They were a little bit like the uh, 18th century version of the garden gnome. And uh, so it's very important to realize that what you now see in lead actually in the 18th century was intended to simulate marble. So moving on from that now, we're gonna move on to, uh, there's another shot. Uh, so here we are, this is the, the North Hall. Um, you, this is an engraving from 1845 when Queen Victoria and, and uh, Prince Albert visited uh, Stowe and you can see on the right hand side just a slice of the Laocoon in place 
and the mercury that uh, Nick explained to you about before. And then to the mercury, we were lucky enough to find in a antique emporium in America. And I think the next slide will show that hopefully. Here, here he is. Um, has a very black patina on a rather unpleasant base, but remarkably, it is exactly the right size of the one that used to exist. So we had it shipped back to the UK. We then decided that the patina was so horrible that we then recolored it to much more an 18th century look. So the slide coming up will show this in process. So this is us working on it to recreate a much more authentic patina. And then we also made a new marble column for it, a marble plinth. Um, which was taken from the engraving and a description in the cat sale catalog. And here it is. So everything you're looking at um, is now restored as closely as possible. We could possibly get it to the original. Now the Leku, which is the next stage of the life. So here is the original and it's rather wonderful mini temple in the gardens. It's a rather a wet day when we had to see this. But, and it was a very tight fit. We had to, we had uh, half an inch of space to draw that statue out th through the columns. Um, it was then loaded onto a truck and packed and brought back to our studio. Um, and from that point, we then move on to moving to the restoration itself. Now, luckily, the French who cast this were exceedingly good casters and they were very good to us because they made sure that the Laocoon sons actually detached from this, from the main figure itself. So we were able to take those off and mold them separately. So we then did, went through that process and the next slide will show us the, the molding in place. So very similar to the lions. So we're putting, in this case, a, a white silicon rubber on, and then we move on to making the mold in the same way we did before. So lots and lots of pieces of rubber, all encased and accurately copied. And from that point, they're cast by the lost wax process. And here is just a section of the, the, the casting run with its what we call the runners and risers. So this will be, when it's cast, it'll be upside down and the V-shaped dark lump at the bottom is where the bronze will ultimately be poured into the sculpture. And all the other rods, the red rods, are where the air is allowed to escape as you pour the bronze in. So that is done. We get the castings made, um, in this case, multiple castings. And here we are starting to get all the castings produced. You can see the body parts on the, on the image below and a little bit of the base being constructed. And from that stage, we needed to have the replica, this replica, and we needed to have the original next door, because when you break something down into this number of parts, you need to reference all the time the original to make sure everything is in place. So then we start to really reconstruct it. And here we are moving on quite well with putting it together. So we're now welding it and chasing it and starting to put all the pieces in place. And the next slide will show us it almost complete. We're still missing the arms. And I think there's one, one point about the arms, which I will make. Um, the, when this statue was uncovered in, when the original marble was uncovered in, in, in Rome in the 16th century, it, it didn't have its arms, very much like it doesn't here. And in fact, the, 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 the arms were restored in the, by the Romans. And so all these replicas of the Lacoon that we now see around the world in all its different sizes and guises with its arms in place, this is pure supposition. We don't actually know it ever looked like that, but that's what we're stuck with. So the Laocoon is now known to be looking like it does with its arms. And in fact, the one in Rome and the Vatican, they've taken the restorations off and it's seen without its arms now. And then we, after we've got to this stage, we then get to the patination. And here, bizarrely, although we're going to turn this bronze brown, 
we, we first of all put a green patina on it. This is a chemical patina, very traditional methods of working with bronze as foundries have done for hundreds of years. So this green goes on and then we start to put a brown on. And here we are sort of starting to get close to where we, where we want to be with it. And then the final stages are when we actually start to put it in. So we deliver it to Stowe. It's obviously an awkward thing to move. We didn't have a lot of space. We also made the, the wooden plinth. It's, a faux, it's a, a faux porphyry plinth made in wood and painted to look like porphyry. Um, and, but this also was taken from uh, a description of the base that was in the catalogue, uh, telling us that it was like green porphyry. So we put this on the plinth and then we end up hopefully with the sculpture as Nick showed it, and I'm going to show you another image of it now in its final position. There it is, um, and complete. And I think to finish, uh, I'm sure that was a whistle-stop tour of thousands of hours of work, but um, the, the final bit is a little time-lapse uh, uh, film of the sculpture going in. Fantastic. Uh, Rupert, really wonderful to see uh, what happens in what well, I can only describe it. I mean, I've been to the foundry, so I've seen it and uh, that kind of uh, the, the, the smoke, the smells, the, the kind of essence of, I guess, Dr. Frankenstein's uh, house are, are very much in, in evidence there, I feel. Uh, so uh, and particularly what I loved was the you explained the alchemy of what you do, how you convert, how you can restore statues uh, in, in, in this case in Stowe. So fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Now, now we've got a series of questions. I've got uh, some on my phone, some on the screen. So I'm going to start with one on my phone, which is uh, one for you, Nick, first. And that is that we've been talking about how you uh, recreate the appearance of places such as Stowe, either through the return of originals or the their uh, the replication, and I think there's a tension in here. On the one hand, you want to recreate the magic of Stowe as it originally was, and on the other, you want to be honest about what's new and what's not new. So, how did you get the balance right at Stowe, and how how would you know? How would you tell the difference? Uh, it's a very good question, John. Uh, telling the difference, I think, in some cases is obvious. I, I, it's very clear that the lions, the Laocoon and Mercury are statuary of an appropriate type. The sphinxes in the Egyptian hall are, if you like, a bit of fun. Uh, they're there because we happen to find them and they represent what was there once upon a time. Um, I think the magic is the ingredient that we're all looking for so for us i think that it's that discovery when you first walk into a place you see something that it, it raises your eyebrows and it's particularly apparent with children when children come into the house they notice the statuary and that is their wow factor but i think different people find it in different ways for some it's the atmosphere that's being created can you imagine those spaces particularly the north hall without Leocon and uh, mercury or um the marble saloon without the statuary for others it's the story you tell and it's that uh, technology how it's been uh, how technology has been involved in what you've produced and the traditional techniques because in a sense we're repopulating the house we're doing just what the owners did when when they first acquired statues as Rupert has said the lions are a copy of the marble lions uh, in the Roger de Lanzi Laucorn is a copy of the original in the Vatican um, only the methods have changed ever so slightly. So I think, I think the key thing is not to pretend something is something it isn't. Uh, to be clear that 
a lot of work has gone into repatriating originals, a lot of work goes into conserving the originals or making copies, and occasionally, as I say, you get a, a good close copy with the, the Mercury. On other occasions, you have something that uh, you know one day will be replaced. Well, I don't know if that helps. Uh, Oh, it certainly helps, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. And and as you say, the the role of the people who steward the house in they, their ability to, uh, to to point out that which are different, which are original, that that plays a role too, of course. Yeah, and, they, and they love it because they love to tell the story of how these things are being brought about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I've got one for Rupert, and that is, uh, and we, uh, Nick, you've already touched on the fact that technologies change. Uh, and this is that your work is is all about using traditional methods to conserve or recreate works of art. Uh, new technologies emerge all the time. We're thinking particularly of digital technologies. How do these fit in with what you do? Well, I think generally speaking, we, we would not necessarily need to use very much new technology in what we do. We rather pride ourselves that we go back and try and make things as close as possible using the techniques that were originally used. However, the issue of digital scanning might be useful for reference, particularly when you're trying to put something together. I wouldn't use digital scanning and CNC machining to make a copy because I feel that's, they always need afterwork. You lose the feel of the hand of the artist. It's a machine made thing. We try and retain that in our work. The other the area, I suppose, that we do use new technologies for would be, we're always looking to industry for new methods that may help us. Laser, laser welding, for instance, is something that may be useful for us for some things um, because it reduces the amount of heat we need to put to work. We're looking for new adhesives, new surface coatings, things like that, but they all stem from industry. And we try and take them as conservators and see whether there's a use for them in our particular field of work. Wonderful, thank you, Rupert. Uh, I've got a couple of the same question actually coming from two different people. So from Lynn and from Megan, and that is, uh, it's picking up on the point that you made, Rupert, about uh, we, we haven't restored the, the, the lions, for example, back to the original marble effect finish. Uh, so the question is why or why not? Well, the answer to that is, I would like to have done. <laughs> um, but, but there are, if you, there are several country houses that we have um, actually repainted the stash room, and it makes a massive difference, uh, particularly if you have statuary in, in niches on a building, as you would have at. Um, let me think where we. Uh, well, actually, let's take gardens, Stourhead, for instance, or Studley Royal, where you've got a lot of greenery in the background, and a grey lead statue is completely lost in the vistas. And as soon as you paint them white, back into their marble colours, they really stand out and they act as focal points. And it's a huge difference. And those projects we have done where we've repainted statues have been seized. Once people are informed and understand that that's why we're doing it and there's history to it, it's very much enjoyed and, and favoured as a way of doing it. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to someone asking me to come and paint the lines of stone. <laughs> we, we've kept an open mind on this, John. Uh, we had a, a long debate with the experts informed by Rupert, and a lot of them said you should paint them to represent marble. In the end, there were two factors that made us pause for a while, and we will, we will revisit it because all these things are, are changeable. One was that we thought we might confuse people who would think, why have you gone to all the expense of a lead statue and now painted it to look like stone? And as Rupert says, you have to explain why you've done that. Um, the other reason was that we actually quite like seeing the various textures that are involved. So Rupert showed the spun copper urns on the balustrade alongside the lions, uh, which he also made for us. And what we didn't see was that the railings are a natural metal as well. So we liked having the three materials, but um, yeah, I think we're going to have to listen to the experts. 
I suppose it, it illustrates that these are never simple decisions. There's often uh, a whole range of views on what can happen to when you when you carry out active conservation. So that, and often there is no one right decision. You're you're kind of narrowing down a series of options. Uh, I have another question, and this uh, and good one as well. This is from Norman Hudson. Uh, and he's asked the question that having done all that work to make the moulds, uh, what's your view about making several replica castings with a view to selling a limited number to offset the cost of the work, uh, as would a contemporary sculptor? Views on that? I'm, I'm happy to just open that one. Um, well, the, the answer is with the layer cube particularly, that's a privately owned sculpture. And um, we were very lucky to get permission. And Stowe was lucky and WRF were lucky to get permission to actually mold it in the first place. The owner uh, of the sculpture now owns the molds. And so it's entirely up to him what he does with them. Um, the problem with making replicas like that is you have potential of devaluing the original if you made large numbers of them. And I think for the time being, that is definitely not the case. Um, in the case of the lions, um, we made a decision that they were molded and they were being made and the molds have been destroyed, so we're not going to make any more. Clearly, there is a commercial aspect to making copies. Um, how you manage that and how you set a price for it and whether or not it's a sensible thing to do, maybe Nick wants to um, contribute in that one. Yeah, I, th I think it is. It's a really good question. And in the case of the Lelka one, there is a clause that the owner of the mould can make one more copy. Uh, I, th I think you know, that he only make one. We had an inquiry about the lions, but people are quite surprised by the cost of something that size. And it's, a, it's not a trivial response to a serious question, but what I would quite like to do, to be honest, is to make small copies of them. I think the lions in particular would make magnificent bookends if we could scale them down. But again, we are controlled by the agreement with Blackpool Council. Uh, and I dare say that for shared royalties, they'd be happy to, uh, to see us do it. And it is a potentially a way that we could uh, recoup some of the costs, absolutely. Thank you, Nick. I'll take uh, your uh, small lions if people would like to place orders through you, John. <laughs> I'm sure it can be arranged. Um, uh, just a, a kind of last couple of questions, really, because we're running out of time. And the relate to, again, same the uh, uh, same question. And that is to do with, uh, it's from Anne uh, Chapman Daniel and Megan Hobson. And that is, do you treat the statues which are going outside in terms of their finish or the processes any differently from statues which you know will be protected inside? Uh, I will answer that in the sense that pretty much everything we've done um, could, would, could and is outdoors. So, I mean, the, the original air coon is obviously outdoors and they are treated in exactly the same way, to be perfectly honest. We, we, with bronzes, we would maybe put a shellac lacquer on them or varnish on them as they would have had originally, which would have a maintenance coating of wax. With lines, um, we put patination on oil, on oil on them to stop them changing the patina too much, but we don't do anything other than gentle gentle maintenance and regular maintenance and it wouldn't matter whether they were inside or outdoors we would do the same thing it's just the frequency would change okay uh wonderful and i say i'm going to take this as my last question i'm sorry i haven't managed to get through them all but we've done well uh and this is are there similar or exact copies in munich uh, of the lions in uh, at the church of the Theatines. Do you know the answer to that, Nick? Because I don't. Um, no, but I, it's, it's ringing a bell with me, John, that there are lions like these there. Um, there is one in St. Petersburg, uh, a Medici lion. So I would imagine that there are similar designs, perhaps even copies. Uh, in a number of places. I know St. Petersburg has a, a marble one down by the river by the um, the Art Academy, and there's one in the Repin Academy itself. So, yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised. And, and I got a vague memory of seeing one or a pair outside a church in Munich. Okay.
Thank you, Nick. Uh, and I have to say the chat is now setting. We've got at least one order for your miniature lions, by the way. It's already already in the in 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 the process of being ordered. Uh, we have now run out of time. It's inevitable with these things that uh, we could have spoken for hours. The questions are beginning to roll in. Uh, and uh, you can see people are prompted by the kind of curiosity about how how do you do how do you do conservation and what are the complex series of questions that you're seeking to answer and then how do you answer them so you can see that coming through uh, the questions uh, I say I'm, I'm going to wrap up I, I think that the key thing for me to do is to, to do some thank yous uh, and uh, this has been a fascinating session. I, I wanted firstly to say thank you to, uh, and most importantly actually, to Nick and to Rupert. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from the real experts uh, and uh, virtually uh, I will represent the whole of the audience in being the only one that you can hear at the moment to give you some proper applause. Uh, and since it's the, the Tour de France uh, on Saturday, I'll say chapeau to you both. So thank you both very much for that uh, excellent series of presentations. Uh, the second people I wanted to thank are just actually the team, uh, both in New York and in the UK from World Monuments Fund. It's always appreciated, particularly if you have issues around the Wi-Fi and getting them to awkward locations in the middle of the Thames. So thank you to the team. Uh, thirdly, and by no means uh, uh, unimportantly, I want to thank all the people who've supported uh, the, the sites that have been mentioned today uh, at Strawberry Hill, at Stone, uh, Castle Howard, through the World Monuments Fund. So your support has been absolutely crucial to all that we do, and uh, it's greatly appreciated. And I'll give a brief shout out for the Historic Houses Foundation as well, who I know have supported a number of these sites. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's all that's left for me to do is to thank you, the audience, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Do please look out for future World Monuments Funds events, and I hope to see you all next time Thank you very much and goodbye.